welcome all WCL members. Uh, I have an interesting game that was sent to me by one of you, uh, played a little while ago, and uh, it was a French defense. Let's see, it's an interesting game. Started out with very standard moves of the French, and in fact, theory was followed for quite some time. White chose to play knight c3, protecting the pawn, which is perhaps the best move actually in this position, although not the only one. And here, black has three main roads. Besides the game move, black of course can develop with knight f6 or trading pawns on e4 right away. However, the most ambitious and aggressive move is to create a pin over white's knight on c3, by playing bishop b4. And now white continued by playing e5 because in this position the pawn now was under attack as the knight on c3 is pinned. So e5, this of course closes the position in the center and now black typically would play c5 to immediately try to counterattack in the center, attack the base of the white pawn chain in the middle of the board. Here the most common and perhaps best move is to play a3 and then black typically would trade on c3, white recaptures and it's true now that white has doubled pawns on the c file which is a disadvantage compared to having connected pawns on different separate files. But as compensation, white has the advantage of pair of bishops, meaning that white has both bishops, but black only has one of them. More concretely, black may suffer from not having the dark squared bishops in uh, having weak dark squares in certain situations or after the white queen appearing on g4 attacking the pawn on g7 often can create unpleasantness for black. But of course this is just very generalizing and simplifying things. In reality this is a very well analyzed and often played opening line that well, is well playable for both sides. However, in this game, white played bishop to d2, which is one of the sidelines compared to a3. And its idea is clear to unpin the knight and to prepare a knight jump to b5. That's how white would continue, for example, if black would win the pawn the white knight would appear on b5 and of course on one hand threatening to gain the pawn back or for example after the exchange of bishops on d2 black would have a rather unpleasant situation being unable to stop the knight from getting to d6 to check and that would strip black from the right to castle. So in a nutshell, this is the idea of the fifth move, bishop d2 of whites. In this game, black continued with knight e7 developing rather than hunting for the pawn on d4. The whole idea behind this move is to castle or to be ready to castle as soon as possible. So after knight b5, which by the way happened in the game, exchange of the bishops. Now black is ready to castle before the check would arrive on d6. So it's quite important for black to castle before the knight would get there. Of course the knight now could still get there but by no means it would have the same effect as when it arrives there with a check. In this position, there are two main moves that has been played by masters and even stronger players. One of them is to capture the pawn on c5. Of course, this would only be a temporary gain of pawns as black in such positions can play 
knight d7, for example, attacking both pawns, and it's only a matter of time when black would win the pawn back. On the other hand, in this game, white played f4 at the moment, which is also a commonly played move. And here, black could trade on d4 right away, but chose rather to play a6, attacking the knight. And of course, the knight wants to come into d6. Now, a knight on d6 does not necessarily have an immediate target or threat, but it's there to kind of paralyze the black pieces, take away important squares from the black army. Black proceeded, trading pawns on d4. And of course, white is in no rush to recapture, because if the white queen would capture the pawn immediately, black could gain time by developing the knight to c6, for example. Instead, white chose the natural developing move, knight f3, and is hoping to capture the pawn on d4 eventually with a knight. Now, black developed also with knight to c6, and white rather develops than gets the pawn back for now. And this is a very interesting moment of the game when action starts happening. Quite typically for this type of pawn structures and for this opening, the French defense, black usually plays c7, c5 with the pawn, which he already did, to undermine the base of white's pawn chain in the center. And in addition, very often black would play f6 to get rid of this pawn on e5 that's greatly paralyzes the black position and of course gives a great support for the knight on d6. So now white has to be a little bit careful to move the pawn from e5 or even to capture the pawn on f6 because then the knight on d6 would not have support. In the game white castled and black captured the pawn on e5, and so did white. Now, this is a very interesting position, where black chose the book move. All this has been played still, believe it or not, in a famous game that was played in Yugoslavia back in 1977, and in that game, just like in this one, black chose to sacrifice an exchange in order to then capture this key center pawn on e5. Now in this position, white has a rook, extra rook, for black's extra knight and two pawns. So on the numeric value, that kind of balances out. In the game I mentioned, that was played in Yugoslavia between Janosevic and Marovic, white actually continued by playing rook h3 and according to the analysis of that game black was doing okay even though white got to capture a pawn on h7. Without going too much into the detail of this theoretical position let's continue with the game that was sent in by the WCL member. In this game white his opponent played Queen to f4, which is a very interesting move, giving back the sacrificed exchange, so giving black the option to capture the rook now on f3. I believe this is a better move actually than the book move rook h3. Now, of course, black is not able to capture the knight that seems to be hanging there because of the checkmate arriving on f8. Let's go back to moves. And in this position, black captured the rook with a check. 
Now, of course, the white queen is not able to recapture because it's busy holding on to the knight on d6. But white recaptured with the pawn. And now the key square is the f7 square. White has threats to appear there with the queen. And then even play knight e8, for example, after the black king goes to the corner. So in this position, let's look what are black's options here. If queen f8, which would be a very natural move, trying to exchange queens, would be a blunder. I bet you can spot why. Because of a typical deflection combination by bishop h7 and then the black queen would fall. Playing knight c6 to protect the pawn on d4 would also not be a good idea because it would still allow the check with the queen and then white would have a very strong move by playing queen h5 threatening checkmate immediately and then after g6 the bishop can just take the pawn because of the pin and also of course the threat of the fork with knight f7 is very devastating for black. Let's go back to the game position which is this where black rather played knight f5 which is the best choice. And now white captured, traded on f5 and captured back. Up to this point I think both sides played quite well perhaps preparing for this game or played it before because remember this is a 3 minute game, a 3-0 game where of course you have to play rather fast so I bet both sides had maybe not quite this position but up to a couple of moves ago before and this is the first moment when I think uh, mix mistakes start happening which is expectable in such a short time control game here uh, white played queen to e5 which is inferior to rook e1 that would bring the rook a new piece to the game with a tempo threatening immediately with a fork moving the rook up to e8 and then after black would defend that with bishop d7 white could capture the pawn on d4 attacking the pawn on d5 and white has good compensation for the pawn probably winning another pawn back shortly. Instead the game continued with queen e5 when white is attacking the pawn on d5. It looks like quite a serious move, dangerous move because after that check if the black king goes to the corner the white knight can appear on f7 either by forking or maybe even trying to checkmate depending how black would continue now. But black here found the best defense that actually turns the table around and gives black the upper hand all of a sudden. Black activated the queen with queen g5. King moved out of the check. Remember now white is threatening to checkmate in one move with queen e8. Also white is threatening to bring the rook into the attack as well as still capturing the pawn on d5. And again black found the best defense in this position by playing queen e3. Considering that black is two pawns up still at the moment, naturally exchanging queens would greatly help black's cause. The most natural response, queen takes pawn, would be answered by blocking the check of course, not by moving the king out. And then queen captures the second pawn back, now there is material balance but black succeeded in developing completely and maintaining initiative and in fact it is white's king that's in a more delicate position than blacks.
Black is better in this position. Let's go back. And after queen e3, when black offered the trade of queens, white found the best move to trade queens under his own terms by playing rook e1. And now black was playing for a win by trading queens and then playing bishop to d7, the only move. And here white made a mistake. White was better off capturing the d5 pawn first. Instead, white made a mistake by capturing the one on f5, allowing black to trade the bishop for the knight and immediately, very actively, take initiative by playing rook c8. As you can see, the pawn on c2 now is under attack. And if it advances, whether to one or two squares, it would be lost in either case. White took the pawn, so did black. And now white captured the pawn on d4. It would be too dangerous to go and try to capture the pawn on b7 instead, because then the d pawn would run away and would be unstoppable, considering that the white king is stuck on the first rank and in the corner far away from the pawn. Let's go back and white in this position captured the pawn on d4 which is still the best chance although black has a winning endgame here having an extra pawn and just as importantly having a very active rook on the second rank cutting off white's king on the first rank keeping it away from action. White advanced the pawn out of danger's way. And here I think the best, simplest way to continue for black would be to advance the B pawn immediately, creating a passed pawn. Black played G6, which I don't really understand quite why it was necessary. And now the white rook managed to get to the seventh rank for the moment, at least cutting off the black king. Black continued with rook b4 which I think is an outright error because it releases the white king from its captivity. Instead I think black should have played immediately b5 and then after the exchange of pawns and the white rook going behind the pawn kind of trying to keep uh, two tasks uh, taken care of at the same go, being behind the pawn, the passed pawn on the B file, as well as trying to keep the black king away from being able to help the pawn or leave the 8th rank, just like black is doing to white's king. The difference is that now black can simply advance the pawn further, and while white keeps waiting then already the black king is able to move over to the queen's side because white does not have the time to capture the pawn on h7 as then the rook would free itself up from protecting the pawn on b3 and when the rook retreats to b7 then b2 comes followed by a check and the pawn promotion. Let's go back, a couple of moves. As I said, black instead chose rook b4, which accomplishes a very similar position, but with a big difference that the white king won't be stuck on the first rank anymore. In this position already, white's chances are much better to draw the game than it was in the previous variation. Black continued with h5, and amazingly, black quite a bit misplayed this endgame from here on, kind of inviting to activate the white king, got to the point that in fact white got a winning position. And again, here black needed to restrict the white king by playing rook a4, and only then try to advance his own pawn. Look what happened now. Black 
just mind his own business and advanced his pawn, allowing the white king to advance. And after a4, the king advanced all the way to g5, attacking the black pawn on g6. Game rook g2 check, king f6. So now it's already black who needs to watch out just as well. The pawn on a4 is hanging and sometimes even some checkmate problems may appear. And here black should have played rook g3 attacking the white pawn and if that advances then black can also advance the pawn to a3. That would have been an easy draw for black. Here black played rook f2 and now white got to capture the pawn and all of a sudden threatening checkmate. And this is where black made real difficult his own life by not capturing the pawn on f3, perhaps forgetting due to short of time that after rook a8 black can block and easily save the game. Instead, black gave another check, and after that, it's only black who needs to worry about losing. Continued rook a2, f4, a3, and f5. It's true that uh, in these type of rook end games, with having f and h pawns, even without having the a3 pawn for black, with correct and very accurate play, the game often is still a draw. The interesting part is that oftentimes when black tries to hang on desperately to that pawn on a3, sometimes can be the cause of the loss. In the meantime, black played rook f2, king g6, rook g2, king f6 and a2. At least the black pawn now is really far advanced. h5, rook b2. Of course, with correct play, the game still should be a draw. King h8, king g6, threatening with a back rank checkmate, rook g2 check, and king h7. And white protected the pawn on h6 with the rook, and here, black played rook g5, which was already a mistake. It's easier just to keep the rook on b2, so the rook could check from the side on the 7th and 8th ranks if he wants to. Rook g5 is just not a good place for the rook. Typically, it's best to keep your rook from as far of a distance as possible from your opponent's king. So you can give multiple checks and it's hard for the king to hide. White advanced by playing f6 and here black made the losing mistake. Black had to retreat the rook to g2 to hang on to that last and only pawn. After this rook captured on a2 and white reached the winning position because now white is threatening with a check on h2, which would force the exchange of rooks. And after rook b5, white checked anyway, forcing the king out. And then after king g7, the f pawn either promotes or black, as in the game, was forced to give the rook up for the pawn. And white reached a king and rook versus king and game, which of course is a very simple win. We have to admit, though, that not necessarily when you have two seconds on your clock. And eventually, White lost on time, and the game ended in a draw, even though White was a whole rook up. Well, thank you so much for listening, and I encourage all of you WCL members, please don't be shy. Send in your games. Uh, so I have a nice pool to choose from, and one of these weeks, one of your games will be analyzed. Thank you for listening, have fun, and if you like these lessons, why don't you join the PCU lessons as well. Mm -hmm.